Hello, um, I'm Chris Rakakis, uh, Director of Modeling and Simulation at Julia Computing, uh, Research Affiliate and Co-PI of the Julia Lab at MIT CSAIL, and Director of Scientific Research at Pumas AI. I'll go through a little bit of the of, of each of this work, um, so pharmacometrics, the you know, Formula One, et cetera, et cetera, and, and really talk, kind of talk about the continuing advancements of differentiable simulation for scientific machine learning. So what the hell does that title mean, right? Um, so the core point that I'm gonna have here is that differentiable simulation is hard, but it's worth investing a lot more time in. And basically, uh, you know, using optimized numerical methods as part of the way that we do machine learning and model discovery seems to be the way to be able to get the most performance and the most bang for your buck out. Um, what I'm going to show is that, you know, there are ways to kind of try to skip it. You know, there are ways to kind of just try to do standard machine learning and throw away everything that we've done with numerical analysis, throw away all of our high order integrators and such. But every time that we come back to and try something, we see that actually using all of that knowledge of numerical analysis appropriately gives us an algorithm that is better. And so trying to get the software to be able to integrate, you know, everything about, you know, hardcore preconditioners and all that with machine learning is really the direction that we've been going. Um, and we've been seeing that, you know, there's so many performance gains that we're getting, and we still see that we're probably at least 100x away from where we want to be. And we have some clear benchmarks that show us that there's still 100x to go. So um, so let me just start by, by you know, talking about uh, what we you know, what is what is a core method here? Oh, hopefully all the slides are oh, OK. The slides are kind of a little bit off, but uh, so uh, so the core method I'm going to start with here is the universal differential equations. Um, and the idea behind it is to do machine learning in a way that integrates, uh, you know, to do machine learning in a, in a way that integrates your scientific knowledge by making the machine learning part of known models. So here's the simplest version, right? You have an ordinary differential equation. And for this ordinary differential equation, you append a neural network to it, right? So you say, my differential equation is, you know, that rabbits will grow over time if you leave them alone uh you know and wolves if you know if you just leave wolves in a room they will die over time right you know you don't just end up with more wolves and so there's you know if you put a wolves and rabbits into a room uh something happens but we don't necessarily know what happens uh let's make that be a neural network why is a neural network a way to represent this well because this is the property of machine learning so neural networks are universal function approximators their whole purpose is that for an arbitrary rn to rm function what they can do is they can learn to be epsilon close to any possible such function and so here what we're saying is that we have a modeling environment where we can write down everything that we know about the scientific model and just capture the pieces that we don't know with a neural network Right. And why would we do this? Well, this means that we can impose a lot of properties in the learning process. Right. So, you, you know, if you have a differential algebraic equation, which has some unknown functions, you can impose conservation of mass. If you have if you do this with neural networks in the appropriate way within a graphical ODE, you can impose that you have, you know, conservation of, of individuals in an epidemic model. You can use all of this prior knowledge that you have. And so what you can start to do is you can use this as not just a way to model, but also improve the modeling process. So here what I'm showing is that lockable terror case where we say, OK, you know, let's let's take, a, you know, rabbits go up over time, wolves go down over time. There's some unknown interaction and let's fit that to data. What we do is we fit the parameters and the weights of the neural network simultaneously to learn what the weights need to be in order to capture the neural uh, to capture the data. Once you do that, you have this this you have this system which is like, OK, I know parts of the equation. Some of them are symbolic. The other pieces come from a neural network. But you can then do things like symbolic regression, which uh, Julius will talk about later, um, which will take a neural network and then spit out the symbol uh, a symbolic representation of that. And so you can almost think about this as simulated annealing for function space, right? You say, I don't know what is what it, there is in my model. Please autocomplete it for me. You bring it to this continuous optimization space to find out what is the missing function. And then you bring it back to this discrete symbolic space by using this symbolic regression approach. And it turns out to be a highly, you know, a, a very easy way to kind of just kind of slap this automatic model discovery in a lot of places. So to really showcase what's going on, I want to go step by step with the case with epidemic models. Um, so here's what happens if you just do, you know, U prime equals a neural network, right? So this is this is machine learning at its finest, right? So we, we train it on zero to, 20, 0 to 21 days worth of data. You know, the neural network captures the time series on the data that we train it. And then we tell it what will happen in the, we ask it the question, what will happen in the future for this ep epidemic and it just does something right because that's what machine learning does right it doesn't generalize beyond its data set 
But you know, this is pure machine learning, right? U prime equals a neural network, learn everything for me. But with an epidemic model, we have a lot more prior information, right? You know, you've probably heard the SIR model at least 30,000 times since the pandemic started. Well, here's an SEIR model, right? So susceptible individuals become, uh, become exposed, exposed individuals become uh, infected, or they can die, and then uh, some of them recover, right? So D is death. And so for, for a lot of these parameters, you can get them externally from the data set that you're going to train this uh, to train things on. Like, for example, what are the percentage of people with COVID-19 who get infected and, and, and perish, right? This is well-known data that's out there. So you can know what the ratios of a lot of these parameters have to be beforehand. So you can write down a model where you know most of the parameters, but you have a data set time series that you need to fit. And there's one piece about this model that we don't have in here, right? It's how does someone get exposed to COVID-19? That is dependent on, you know, whether they wore masks, whether they're supporters of Donald Trump, right? Because that's dependent on whether they would go to a rally or where they would stay at home, you know, uh, whether they're in China versus, you know, in, in the United Kingdom with all these different policies, right? How do you model exposure is something that is really hard to do. It's, it's something that's dependent on so many different things, so let's not even try. So what we now have is we have a epidemic model as all the properties of an epidemic model, but we have one term in there that is exposure is unknown, where I can place my neural network right there, right? And as I mentioned, if, if you look at the mathematics of this model, it has all the properties that we want of an epidemic, right? It has conservation because anyone who go, go, is susceptible becomes exposed. So, you know, if you if you look at S plus E plus I plus R plus D, no matter what neural network weights you have, those will add up to be a constant, right? You know, the, you know all, the, all these different properties that you would expect from an epidemic model and all these mathematical properties that you get from the mathematical modeling follow from this formulation. It's just now you don't have to model the thing that you don't know. And what happens when you do this is if you fit this against your time series. So here we do the same 0 to 21 days, right? We extrapolate it out to the future. You see that you get something that's actually able to capture quite a bit about how the epidemic is working. It gets to about 21 days. Now, the last step is to take your neural networks that you've learned and then actually bring it back down to giving you a prediction about what is missing from your model. So this has been the internal sparse regression where you say, I've learned what is missing in my model, and I take this, this piece that is some nebulous machine learning object, and I want to convert it back into something that is a representation of symbolic. So what is, the, what is the simplest representation of what I was missing from my model? And this is what happens when we got what we get from this model. And there's two things that happen here. One thing is that, as we know, you know, simpler models tend to have a lot very good generalizability pro uh, properties, and you see that it improves generalizability quite a bit. It learns something that wasn't exactly the, the model. You know, it's, it's different from the model that generates the data, et cetera, et cetera, and, and so it doesn't match perfectly. But these, this symbolic regression seems to improve the generalizability in a lot of these cases. Exactly why is actually still a bit unknown, and this is something we're looking a lot into. Um, but the other thing that you get out of it is you actually get mechanistic predictions, right? So this is a very fun case because the mechanistic prediction here that it makes is fairly easy to understand because this neural network was, was, tra was trained to allow itself to be dependent on S, I, and D. The amount of people who are susceptible to, uh, to COVID-19, amount of people who are infected with it, and the amount of people who died from it. And what this what this term learns is that, oh, in order to make this data work out well, in order to learn the right uh, exposure model, um, U2, U1 shows up in here, U2 shows up in here, but U3 does not show up at all. And so this is a mechanistic prediction. Exposure to COVID-19, uh, do, it does not change with, uh, depending on the number of people who are currently dead, right? And you don't get COVID-19 from people who are already dead, you get it from people who are infected. And so th that's actually there, right, right there in the discovered form of the model. And so what we find is that this is kind of a form of, of machine learning, which uses all of our prior information about models, gives us a form of interpretability and improves our, our ability to predict with low data. And that's really the key here, right? It's this mixture of mechanistic modeling with machine learning. And, what, and so, you know, we did this on some very simple examples to start, but really the, the key thing that's been really fun about working on an open source project, you know, is, you know, within the last two years, I think that we got 400 citations of people using this all over the world. So, um, 
You know, we showed that, oh, hey, look, you, you get very good extrapolation from, from training data. But then someone came along and, and looked at, you know, here, for example, is the LIGO black hole. Uh, you know, so, so there was a black hole merger that happened, right? Um, and, and the gravitational wave data from, uh, from LIGO was used to be able to, you know, that was the first detection of gravitational waves, right? Um, but someone that took this data and said, well, here's a, here's a quick question, right? So black holes that are, mer that are merging, um, they they are moving so fast that you have to use relativity, right? But what if we just took uh, Newtonian mechanics, right? What if we just took Newtonian mechanics and we said, we asked the question of how should we extend Newtonian mechanics such that you get a such that you get the geodesic equations for these merging black holes, right? And so this was this is pulled directly from the paper where they use this universal uh, universal approximator F one two three four, um, whereas this first term is is just a, a, the rotating black holes in Newtonian physics, right? You can even kind of tell like oh divided by the mass, you know this this is like that this is the 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 motion equation there that you get from standard Newtonian physics in in some like rotating frame. Um, and then they said, OK, learn from me what it, what Newtonian physics is missing from the model and extend it. And you can see that they learned from these black data points. Uh, they extended it. Uh, the true waveform, what it's supposed to predict is blue. What the prediction is is orange. And so uh, this is what they're able to do. And you know, it, in for machine learning, this is wow. For physics, this is like, oh, you didn't get uh, six decimal places correct. But you know, this this is a uh, this is this, it was kind of cool to see this, right? Because it's like you don't expect machine learning to have this extrapolation property. But as I mentioned, you know, it's not just pure machine learning extrapolating. It's machine learning that has a lot of properties pre-imposed on it with uh, with you know a some you know with a symbolic reduction to a smaller space. That is something that is able to overcome some of the issues with with pure machine machine learning, right? And so they were able to show nice extrapolation properties there. Um, another case is with uh, earthquake safe buildings, um, you know, where, where a similar thing happened where, you know, the training data is this very small, you know, this very small start, right? You know, here, here they, they only trained on this little bit and they extrapolate forward. Here they train a little bit and they extrapolate forward. You can see that the pure physical model uh, extrapolated in a way that was incorrect. Whereas the machine learning model was able to correct these pieces, and you know, if you want to see, I think that there's like 30 nice examples. I, I actually have a video that just walks through a bunch of example after example of example of these successes here. So just watch that other YouTube video. Basically, I just wanted to show here that you know this is not something that's just been shown on toy problems. This is something that's now been repeated tens and tens and tens of times. Um, I think you can say it's been repeated at least in the hundreds, uh, but I haven't gone through every single paper about it. But these are just two that I pulled out from the citation list, right? So, so this kind of, uh, you know, this this is what we call scientific machine learning. This is scientific computing, you know, writing physical models with partial differential equations and everything, and mixing it with machine learning to be able to cover our in a, in our, our uncertainties and what we don't know. Um, and what we've really done with the ecosystem is we brought it beyond just the ODE cases. So, you know, if, when you look at this, there's way too many differential, different, different types of differential equations, but it includes things like differential algebraic equations, stochastic differential equations, hybrid jump equations, and all that. Um, so here, for example, you know, once again, pulling from the citation list, um, someone used this to be able to predict what was missing in the in the known physics of propulsion devices, and be able to once again uh, be able to use once the the learned model of of what was missing about uh, I think it was missing terms about friction within a propulsion device to be able to then uh, improve the design of the of the propulsion device with respect to this learned friction, right? Um, so this, in this case, it's a neural network in a partial differential equation, right? You know, but if you do the same kind of idea, you know, you, you semi-discretize, you get an ODE. You can use this to be able to learn missing functions in the semi-discretized ODE form, right? And that's uh, that's been able to extend this to a lot of other domains. And so we've been working a lot on the software for you know making it so that way this this can be used very widely. Um, well, I'll talk about some of these other pieces, but we have pieces that can do finite difference methods and uh, and we know methods with uh, with method of lines. Um, we know that the the Trixie um, we we know that the Trixie finite volume uh, methods they are automatic differentiable, and so you can mix the machine learning with in there. Um, the one, the grid app is able to interface with uh, differential equations and make use of this. And so this is kind of expanding it to all these uh, spatial you know, modeling domains. 
Um, and we've been covering a lot of cases that are beyond differential equations. So, you know, I talk a lot of, I'll be talking a lot about differential equation cases, but a lot of things like uh, linear solves, nonlinear solves, optimization itself can be, uh, can be uh, differentiated. So you can use optimization. You know, you can have a neural network that approximates the solution to an optimization process itself and all these kinds of things. Um, so this is, is actually, this is the first time I'm showing the, the picture of the new uh, SciML docs. If you go to docs.siml.com or docs.siml.org, you'll see that there's now an entire documentation describing the whole ecosystem. If you click on solvers, you'll see all these different solvers that are available for different domains of, uh, that have this automatic differentiation support. Um, so it's things from ODEs, PDEs to linear solves, nonlinear solves, optimization, uh, Poisson jump processes, et cetera, et cetera. Because remember, the goal here with scientific machine learning is to differentiate simulators so that way we can use the like the embedded scientific knowledge of simulators as something that to improve our machine learning processes. Right, and in, in, integrate machine learning and neural networks into these simulators instead of trying to replace them all from scratch. And I'll, I'll go into more de more details in some pieces here. So you know, in, in each of these details is it, each of these packages is a talk of their own about all the different things that they do, the preconditioner, sparsity support, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to do a side dive here and and kind of go into uh, one one of these one of these questions of like you know. What what are some problems that you can solve like this? You know, so I so I showed, hey, here's some ODEs, here's some PDEs. Uh, there's something missing in here. To find what's missing, right? But what is the expanded universe? You know, what is the you know the Star Trek season three, right? When they start you know expanding new things. How, how, what are more things? You, what are more problems you can think about solving from the SIML idea? And so I think that one that that comes up as a as a nice use case is is something that we're doing in pharmacometrics with deep NLME. So nonlinear mixed effects modeling is this thing that is used in pharmacology for learning how different individuals will be affected by a drug dose. And I think that, you know, this is how it looks like when you when you do the slides and like sales and, you know, at the high level to the pharmacologist. But, you know, if you then talk to a scientific group, this looks better, right? Um, and so what is a what is a um, nonlinear mixed effects model? So the, the nonlinear mixed effects model has this the, what's known as covariates. So every individual who walks into the clinic, they have a weight and a sex. You know, it's like I weigh this much and male versus female versus all other, you know, kind, kind of bits. And and so what you, what what happens when someone walks in is you can say, OK, this is prior information I know. And now from this prior information, I have a structural model. The structural model tells me what the parameters of a differential equation would be. And this differential equation then describes how the drug concentrations within someone's body will, will change. And so let's say you want to ask a question of, oh, you know, so-and-so just walked into the clinic. What dose should I give them such that they're such that the concentration within their body never goes below two and never goes above four? Right, and then you, if you run this whole thing, now you have a way to be able to simulate what will the drug concentration in their body be given a dose, and so now you want to solve the inverse problem. What dose should I give you such that you're going to be safe? Right, and so this is what's done with nonlinear mixed effects modeling for personalized precision dosing. Um, the way now this this is uh, there's something that's a detail in here, which is that you have the you have two types of, of properties. So you have your fixed effects and your and your random effects, and you have to do a special no, uh, maximum likelihood uh, procedure to be able to find out what these theta. These theta are are the you know these theta are always the same for every individual. They're the, known as the fixed effects, and they're kind of the average effect of a covariate um, over the population. And if you know the average effect of covariant over the population, then you know how to change the drug dosing um, given weight or sex. And this is this is a science that's now, you know, there's been 40 years of this method, the nonlinear mixed effects with these uh, maximum likelihood procedures. And there's good software for doing it um, if you can do maximum likelihood estimation, right? Now, we've been doing this a lot. You know, Pumas was used famously by, by Moderna. You can go check out the talk at JuliaCon 2022, where the director head of, of pharmacology and pharmacometrics at Moderna talks about using Julia and the, the Julia tools as part of the, the vaccine analysis. But I think that the most interesting thing that came out of this was that, you know, we, we, we as mathematicians think about like, oh, this is a this is an inverse problem. You know, let me do the maximum likelihood as fast as possible. Let me do the differentiation of this as fast as possible. But when we actually do this this kind of case study what we find is what everyone spends the majority of their time doing is trying to find out what the models are right you know like in, in a real world you don't necessarily know what a good model of a human is and you spend 
eight months trying to do you know this modeling process and then you know the, the fitting process is three weeks and so like we're like yeah we took you know the fitting process from five weeks to three weeks you know software super fast and then you know but you're spending most of your time modeling so what if we can help someone actually discover these models you know that would make it so that way the analysis process would be uh, decreased in a way that is really useful to the, to the into the you know to to the application and you can do the same ideas of scientific machine learning here, where now what we can do is we can put neural networks inside of a nonlinear mixed effects model, right? We still have to differentiate it, right? Because well, what we need to do is we need to solve the same maximum likelihood problem as nonlinear mixed effects. But if we can differentiate this whole model with neural networks slammed into this whole process, then it doesn't matter if this is a very different type of problem. We get the derivative of neural networks with respect you know, of the output with respect to the neural network weights. We can make neural network weights be fixed effects in this whole process. And now neural networks train inside of this whole thing. Right. When, if you get neural networks training within a whole nonlinear mixed effects framework, then you can ask a question of, well, what was the model I should have put here? And that's symbolic regression once more. Right now, you symbolic regress it, and it tells you this model that would have been right there. Right. And so now, if you think about these problems as differentiable simulators, then it becomes a problem of, well, where anywhere that I have uncertainty, I could get being, begin to place neural networks for that uncertainty. And then I can use uh, sparse regression to be able to recover what the functional form would be. And not only that, uh, I can also use everything I, else I know about the problem. You know, I can write down every differential equation. I can write down every covariate model that I know, and have the covariate and have the neural networks just cover my uncertainty. Right. And this is scientific machine learning really being extended. And this is actually something with you know when I put my Pumas hat on, uh, you know, director of, uh, of of research at at Pumas. Right. This is what we're actually doing, uh, releasing software for doing this to be able to semi-automate this modeling process. Right. Basically, we call this kind of a model autocomplete, where it kind of helps you, it gives you up predictions on what could be missing from your model. Um, and you know, so this is something that we've been, it's currently ongoing, uh, the, the test for clinical trials, it got some awards in the pharmacology domain. Um, and so this is really something that can be, well, it's, it's looking like it's starting to be used um, probably about two weeks from now. <laughs> so, so it's, it's, uh, it's this, you know, this pipeline of getting scientific machine learning into real world use cases is really kind of there. Um, now, I guess one, one of the questions, though, when, when talking about this, you know, so that's that's what scientific machine learning is doing. But I guess one question to really ask to, is, are we doing it correctly? Um, is this question of does it require actually differentiating the simulator? Right. Are there other ways to do this that you don't require differentiation? And so let's uh, I want to take a look, a deep dive into this paper that we had uh, The 2020 version was 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 uh, a while ago. There's a 2022 version of this that's a bit better now that just went online um, and it, it answers this question in a nice way. So the, the problem that we were looking at is there's a Bosca Ness uh, approximated uh, Navier Stokes equation. All right. And it gives you this this 3D uh, simulation of um, of a fluid dynamic you know, ocean column. Right. And now when you when you put these these columns into a global circulation model for uh, for a climate model, you don't really care about the entire fidelity of a full 3D PDE. Right. In fact, you can't do the 3D PDE over every single spot of the Earth. That's too big. So what you want to do is you just want to approximate the three dimensional partial differential equation by a one dimensional partial differential equation. And so the, uh, so what we what you can do is you can you know you go through the paper, you take an average of, along the xy plane by taking an integral, et cetera, et cetera. And basically the way, what you come down to is that the way that people have done this in previous climate models is this equation sans the neural network. But you know, it's this. This is the first term of, of of an expansion. Then you say plus more terms, and then what you do as a physicist is the higher order terms. You cross them out. You say that they're probably close enough to zero, and there you go. You have an equation, right? But if you don't cross out those extra terms, you can say, ah, uh, there's something else here that I missed. Replace it now with a neural network, and what I can do is I can treat this. I can have this neural network capture my closure terms, right? But how am I going to? Um, Oh, this so it isn't doing the, the animations here. If you watch one of my other videos, you'll get the animation here. Animations are beautiful. Um, but uh, so, so, so uh, what happens 
is it, what, what happens with this uh, is, okay, now how do I train this neural network? One way to train this neural network is to go back, you know, is to basically say this is a residual of my equation. It's a residual of the of the differential equation. So let me look at, you know, a 3D partial differential equation solution. I get what the flux terms at every single time are. I remove the flux terms that I know, know about, and I have a data set that is the flux from the uh, original simulation to the what uh, to what needs to be the uh, you know, to what I need to have it be, you know, and that's input outputs of a neural network. You slam it into any neural network solver or trainer, and then you, you, you make it learn to match the missing fluxes, right? No differentiation of simulators there is required. But if you actually look at what happens with the, with the, with the training process, um, you know, it, this doesn't have the animation, but the animation running shows you that over time, the, 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 the trained version and the untrained version tend to drift apart. Um, and if you're to look, if you're to look at that solution, you go, wow, you know, why would I have a drift in the in the air? Why is the air growing over time? And notice that what we're doing here is we basically have a neural network that is trained to control the derivative of, of this problem to be correct. And over time, what we get is a drift in the air. And I know that there's some people who are trained as controls engineers here. And when they hear that, that, oh, hey, you're only controlling the derivative and you get a drift in the air, you're trained to say, well, what about doing an integral control, right? And so that is effectively what happens when we go to a the, the framework of differentiable simulation. When you look at differentiable simulation, what you're doing is you're basically making this neural network, uh, you know, be the neural network such that the integral of these equations matches the integral of your original simulation. Right? You're you're looking at the temperature instead of the fluxes in the temperature. And if you do that, you get about, uh, you know, if this animation was running, you'd see that the, the version that is using the integral control gets about 10 to the minus fifth error, whereas doing this with the differential control uh, does it only about 10 to the minus two. So it's orders of magnitude, uh, a few orders of magnitude more uh, accurate to, um, to use this process of differentiable simulation, right? So you, there are ways to be able to avoid it. There are ways to be able to train a neural network outside of a simulator and then slap it in. But if you train the neural network in, inside of the simulator as all one process, this actually improves the training the, quite a bit and gives you much higher fidelity or much higher accuracy. So, you know, there are ways to try to avoid differential simulation, but differential simulation really is the key to doing this correctly. Uh, so one, one question that you might have then is, OK, so this seems really nice, right? Scientific machine learning, you can do this to ODEs, some other things, but um, all the models that I mentioned are continuous, right? So what about, for example, let's, uh, here, here's a quick question. Let's say you had an agent-based model of an epidemic. Um, this thing has these things walking around. They have, some people might have seen my tweet, tweet yesterday. Um, uh, and, and so you, you, know, you have this agent-based model, and you go, gee, I want to train a neural network to learn, how, uh, to learn ODEs for the mean of how that evolves over time. Right. So in order to do that, you just have to be able to differentiate your agent based model. But, you know, that's not continuous. So what do you do for these kinds of cases? Right. Um, so so here. Uh, uh, so, you know, the first case that you can look at is uh, chaotic systems. Right. So chaotic systems might look like they're continuous, but they have the property that on large time scales, they actually act probabilistically. This actually is pretty bad for differentiable uh, programming. If you if you run automatic differentiation on a chaotic simulator, um, what you'll see is that your that is that your derivatives grow and explode exponentially over time. Uh, that's actually equivalent to the to the property that your um, that your Lyapunov exponent is uh, is positive because uh, you know the Lyapunov exponent is is measuring the uh, the growth of the tangent space, and what for, forward mode automatic differentiation does is it propagates derivatives through the tangent space, and so your errors grow grow in, uh, infinitely fast, right, or exponentially fast to infinity. And so finite differencing, and and not just finite differencing, but also automatic differentiation fails on chaotic models. A way to understand this too is that your solution to a chaotic model is never actually the true solution. You just get some solution pulled from the from the uh, from from the attractor, right? And this is the shadowing lemma. But what you can do is you can start to do different forms of automatic differentiation, which uh, which we call shadow adjoints. They give you derivatives with respect to the ergodic properties, right? So even though you cannot differentiate a chaotic system because of the air growth, you can you can still differentiate with respect to the average uh, value of you know you can differentiate with respect to the average value of z over time or the average value of x over time, and you can use this to be able to learn what the parameters should be in such chaotic systems and mix scientific machine learning with uh, with chaotic systems. This is one semi non-discrete case, but let's go a bit deeper, right? So 
uh, you have models that are like ODE systems, right? So you have an OD so this is an ODE of a chemical reaction. Uh, you can have a stochastic representation of that. So you know stochastic differential equations. But at the very end of the, of, end of the line, one way to simulate chemical systems is as discrete systems, right? So you have chemical X, you have chemical Y. When they hit each other, they become X, Y, right? You know, you have you you lose one of X, you lose one of Y, and you, and you gain one of X, Y. This is a purely discrete process. But this is something that is discrete, but has some continuously looking things. Right? It's, it's, it's almost a, it's a relaxation uh, to the discrete space of these ODEs. It's a continuous time discrete uh, discrete process. So could you extend automatic differentiation to these kinds of cases so that way you can once again train neural networks within them to say learn what the rate equation is for some chemical binding? Um, so first of all, what we did was we had this whole paper uh, on catalyst.gl about you have to make it sufficiently fast because you know if you don't make these things fast, it will take forever to do any scientific machine learning. So after we made it fast, we're like, okay, how do we actually differentiate this? And we developed a new uh, automatic differentiation style, which uh, so in you know traditional ID is all about taking a program and then generating a new version of that program that computes its derivative. But if you think about your program in this case as giving you something that's stochastic, you know, it's a random variable. What you can do is you can ask the question of, can I take someone's program and generate a new program, which is uh, giving you a, a new random variable, where this the expectation of this random variable is the derivative of the expectation of my first program. Right. And so, you know, if you, you define this this problem where, where, where you then have, you have to do a few tricks, right? Because in this case, you cannot necessarily assume that everything's discrete. What you have to say is, you know, there's, you know, there's there are, you know, infinitesimal perturbations in the output when you have disc, uh, when you have uh, continuous quantities. But if you have a discrete quantity like a Bernoulli variable, right? So, for example, you flip a coin probability P of having heads, you know, if you if you perturb p by by an epsilon amount, what you get is a uh, is you get a um, a infinitesimal probability of having an O of one change. And what you want to do is you want to propagate this this probability of having an O of one change through your code. Um, it, th uh, this is our this is our new package called stochastic ad.jl, where what we, what it does is it allows you to define these these dual numbers, or it will do this differentiation. Where it can differentiate things like the uh, Bernou uh, binomial uh, of ten values, you know, with, with binomial NP, where I want to differentiate that with respect to P, and what it gives you is something that has a a new program that is able to estimate what the expected value of the original program or the derivative of the expected value of the original program. Um, and so this makes it so that way any program that it has these kind of random numbers within them uh, with, within a parameterized form, you can now differentiate those and add that to this space of differentiable simulators. Um, so, so uh, you know, what next I want to kind of go into. So, so this this is really then a, a, as a, as a quick recap here, right? So scientific machine learning ends up being very useful because you can basically embed all of your prior scientific knowledge and use that to be able to have, you know, be able to get a lot of the benefits of, of mechanistic modeling, but incorporate machine learning to kind of make your modeling work faster, right? Um, and what I what I showed is that you need to be able to do differentiation in order to be able to do it accurately, but at least differentiation is in, including more and more domains. But I, I do want to address one question here, which is you might have heard of you know, other methods in scientific machine learning. Now, why would you prefer, say, differentiable simulation over some of these other approaches? So here, for example, is um, it, here, for example, is physics informed neural networks, and that uh, that that animation is definitely not working. <laughs> um, uh, so so um, the way that a, a physics informed neural network uh, works is you have a um, you basically say, OK, a neural network is a universal function approximator. So let me approximate the solution to my to my differential equation. Right. So, you know, if u is supposed to be a quantity u, u of x t, then I put in x, I put in t and what what the neural network spits out, I interpret it as u. And now how do I how do I make sure that this thing actually is you? Well, if, if you can write down your differential equation, right? So, you know, if uh, if du dt is supposed to equal d, uh, uh, you know, the second derivative of u with respect to x. Well, if you differentiate this neural network in x uh, twice, you differentiate this in, in t once, you subtract the two quantities at some value of x and t, that should be zero. 
the amount that that's not zero is a residual from how close it is from to being the correct solution. And so if you just sum up, so you just say sum, the sum over values in my space of X comma T, um, you know, the differentiation of the neural network with respect to T minus the derivative, two derivatives of the neural network with respect to X, you know, that is my residual. You sum it up all, over all space, find the weights of the neural network such that that summation goes to zero. Right. And, and so when that summation goes to zero, this thing will satisfy the property that, you know, one derivative in time equals two derivatives in space. So therefore, this neural network represents a solution to the heat equation. Right. And that's the physics informed neural network methodology. Much easier to explain with the animations, but go watch the other video on that. Um, now, uh, why, you know, and, and so, you know, physics informed neural networks are great because it's very easy to take this and say, OK, you know, graduate student, please pump out a, a, a paper on um, on integral differential equations, right? Well, how do you do that? Well, they stick this neural, they make the neural network be the solution to the integral differential equation. How do they do that? Well, they, you know, they, they take the neural network and they just say, like, oh, you impose this property. And so you evaluate that property at every single point in time with this neural network being the U, right? You, you know, you can integrate over time. You put this U inside of an integrator, et cetera, et cetera. You write down the loss function. And so this is very easy to take a physics informed neural network and extend it to many different differential equation types. Um, now, what about performance, though? Uh, the one thing that that kind of the one thing that's interesting about these these uh, these neural network PDE solvers is that you know if you take them say to this ODE case, so here's for example is a example that's pulled out of the the paper and documentation from DeepXDE, which is one of these neural network uh, uh, PDE solvers. Um, uh, and and what what you can do is you can have this tr it's a solve an inverse problem on the Lorentz equation and you get about 362 seconds and you do this with and you say well I can also train parameters uh, um, you know using differentiable simulation right differentiate my simulator do gradient descent and how long does that take if I use a differentiable simulator you see it takes 0 0.03 seconds right basically the the key here is is that these this physics informed neural network approach is a way to do scientific machine learning right you can say oh i it, it must solve the ode plus it might have a loss function to to mix against the data you know so it's able to do similar things but there's nothing about the numerical analysis of ODEs or PDEs that's embedded in here, right? There's nothing about, you know, fast methods for stiff equations or any of that inside of this training process. It's a pure machine learning training process. And so it should be no surprise that when you get to a case like ODEs where you've studied, you know, how to solve these things really fast, you know, you say differentiate the ODE solver and try to try to train a neural, neural network to match this. There's about a 10,000 times performance difference. Um, you know, I, I do want to kind of mention that, you know, so we see this kind of in the literature quite a bit uh, in, in the opposite direction. So let's actually take a look at one of these cases. So here's a case um, where someone said that, uh, where, where is it? So performing accurate long time simulations um, at all, uh, uh, you know, these neural network methods did this at a fraction of the computational cost needed by all the classical methods, right? So, you know, they, they, here's a paper that says that uh, all of the neural network things outperform everything we've ever done before. Um, if you're a little bit skeptical, let's open up the paper. And then you see like, oh, here's the figure that they have. You know, the deep ONET, the neural network thing uh, was that fast. The neural network solver or the numerical solver is that fast. So everything that we've ever done writing ODE solvers and differentiation uh, now no longer matters. You just solve ODEs with, uh, with uh, neural networks, right? Um, good. The interesting thing here is that it was the same example as one of the tutorials in the differential equation code. So we just copy paste the differential equation code to the right. We run it and we see that. Um, oh, oh, no. Uh, you know, the, if you just run the, the tutorial code from differential equations at jail, it ends up about 7000 times faster than the deep net. And this is on a laptop CPU, uh, actually one that has an atom chip. Uh, versus a the deep O net was trained with a Tesla V100 GPU. So that GPU was like a $2,000, $3,000 GPU versus a, a laptop CPU. And you see that uh, you get thousands and thousands of times faster, right? And the reason to bring this up isn't just to shame people. Um, you know, the, though this does and does give a bit of shame. Um, but I think that the the more interesting thing here is how come the literature can be so far off on differentiable simulation, right? You know, because there, there's so much going on, so much everyone's saying like, oh, neural network solvers for ODEs seem to be doing so so well. But then if you actually open it up and try it in Julia, you see it's thousands of times slower. 
you know, you th see that the, just the Julia differential equation solved with no extra tricks is just thousands of times faster. So what's going on in the literature here? Right? You know, if you if you saw the Fourier neural operator paper that an MC Hammer retweeted, right? Um, you know that that also has the same issue where if you go in and you check the the numerical code, if you check the numerical code, you know it's a very slow implicit Euler PDE solver, and they say, oh, you know this is three times faster. Uh, our neural network method is three times faster. And you know you translate over to Julia, you put it in CVODE, and you say, no, the neural network code is about a hundred thousand times slower than a good code. So why does this keep on happening? And I think that this is one of these big pieces about differentiable simulation, right? That you know if differentiable simulation is is so good, how come you can have some papers that are going this pure neural network solver route? And how come some things end up in the literature that say it's it's OK that to, to you know to get rid of your simulators, right? Why why is there this disconnect, right? And this disconnect actually comes down to a very clear reason, right? Uh, I've gotten in touch with a lot of these researchers, and they said something that was very interesting. They said they spent as much time optimizing their machine learning code as they did their, their ODE code. And you go, OK, that's fair. Or is it? Is that actually fair? Because if you look at what happens on machine learning libraries, right? When you treat things as a machine learning problem, you end up having a lot of matrix multiplications. And with ma uh, machine learning problems, you basically have a bunch of O of n cubed operations. If you have O of n cubed operations, everything that's O of n and O of n squared, when n is sufficiently large because you're doing big neural networks, everything else does not matter. In fact, the only thing that matters for machine learning is you slap something on a GPU so that way the matrix multiplications are faster. A lot of times, the other operations of the neural network are slower on a GPU, but the big matrix multiplication scales so poorly that you only have to care about how fast those go. And so if you even look at how uh, different machine learning libraries, you know, for big neural networks, they really aren't that different in terms of their performance uh, when you get to this big neural network case uh, by too much because it really just comes down to counting, you know, they're all using the exact same QDNN implementation of matrix multiplication on GPUs. So their, their main kernel operation is all the same thing. And so it basically, if you spend almost no time optimizing your machine learning code, you get to about the same place, about 3x from, from optimal. And that's completely not true for scientific computing codes, right? Because you know, someone you know, that we saw some other talks in here where it's like, okay, you know, I did a simple implementation, but you know, MATLAB versus Python, you know, versus Julia. Well, I get a huge performance difference. Why do I get a performance difference? Well, because I did things like mutation and memory management, right? Mutation and memory management; those are things that are O of O of n, right? Because if you, um, you know, if you allocate twice as much memory, it takes your it takes your memory allocator twice as long. Uh, and so what we, what you see is that if you have your program dominated by matrix multiplications, you don't need to worry about mutation and memory management. It's a completely a non factor to your performance. But if you do have a program that is, you know, that is all using O of N and O of N squared operations, memory management matters, manual SIMD matters, and it matters by hundreds of times uh, in, in your performance, as the other, you know, as the other talks on scientific computing codes talk about, right? And so what's really interesting here is that this is like, this is, you know, this is the key thing with, with differentiable simulation. You need to spend a lot more time to be able to actually get it good. But if you get it good, it's about 10,000 times, 100,000 times faster, right? And so this, this is kind of the key, right? When I, when I talk about like, you know, what, what is the key thing? What is the nice thing about physics informed neural networks? Well, it's very easy to make this work for stochastic differential equations, integral differential equations, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have uh, differentiable simulators for integral differential equations yet. It'll take a whole long time to build it but from all of the different cases that we looked at before you know that this time it's like you know 50 60 cases at this point right we know it'll be 100 times faster or whatnot than the neural network approaches it just takes a lot longer to get there and so that is that it then becomes this, this thing where you know why we care so much about differentiable simulation and why we treat it as such a software problem is because we've seen over and over and over that it is something that requires you know difficult to write software to get correct but when you do this correctly it has a lot of advantages um, to kind of showcase uh, what what happens in you know when when you're looking at this. So when we're doing scientific machine learning, right, we're using small neural networks inside of o inside of these ODEs. So what we found is you know we start asking different questions. So for example, I had I did this whole entire discussion of of machine learning, saying big neural network, big neural network, O of n cubed, 
But if you have a small neural network inside of an ODE, like say layers of size eight, um, you know, are PyTorch, is PyTorch optimal? Is TensorFlow optimal? It turns out that they're not even close, right? So we built this, this whole package called simplechains.jl, which is specifically optimizing for small neural network cases. So uh, about 100 uh, size, 100 layers and smaller. Um, and what you get on that is about five times faster than PyTorch. You know, so Julian CPU ends up about five times faster than PyTorch on on GPU for this kind of for this kind of case, right? Because you just can't saturate the GPU. Also, you have memory management issues. All of this stuff matters when you have small enough n. And so this is what's really happening in the scientific machine learning space is that we see that a lot of the assumptions of machine learning libraries fall apart when we get to this case. And there's so much more software to be able to do in the here to do this correctly. Um, so, so semi conclusion there is that you know if you really want to go fast, like Ricky Bobby, what you need to do is you need to spend a whole lot of time with the uh, differentiable simulators, and so that's why we've been doing the the scientific machine learning libraries of Julia. So you know we've been doing a whole lot of things and say you know fast differential equation solvers. We're not even close to done. Um, just uh, you know last month we had one that improved the neural network the stiff ODE solver performance by about two x to four x. Um, uh, I mean, for specific cases, cases where it's between five to 200 ODEs with no implicit parallelism in F, right? So, you know, every single time you make improvements in this ODE solver space, you're making small improvements to specific cases, but it's still pushing this along, you know, 2X and 4X at a time. Um, and so differentiable simulation is, is really, you know, if you, if you think about this as like, this is how fast ODE solvers are today, um, it's going to stay that way. Let's look somewhere else. Definitely not true. Uh, they're still improving quite a bit. Um, you know, in in the case of Gillespie simulations, we just you know had a, a had a hundredfold. Um, you know, I mentioned that on simple chains, we see that in in the case of a deep NLME, right? This uh, deep nonlinear mixed effects models. Um, we we this was the reason for making simple chains, and I think it just sped it up by like a hundred times or hundred times or a thousand times. And so making use of these special, you know, small neural network libraries in specific contexts is a very large improvement in 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 a lot of these cases. Um, one thing to mention along these lines is uh, Enzyme.jl, which is an in, uh, which is a new AD library we've been incorporating throughout scientific machine learning. The reason why it exists is that it operates at the compiler level, so that way the compiler optimizations can be performed before doing differentiation. And the result of that. Yeah, it can be seen on some cases. So, for example, on this case, um, you can actually have the compiler optimize this code, so that way it pulls out this mag call. This mag call is then, you know, something that that requires the from i to n. And so, if you do this, right? So, you, um, uh, this is a um, a loop optimization where if you know that the same op if you know that the same function is going to be called every time in the loop, you pull out of the loop. What you can do is you can do this optimization and then differentiate and get something that's O of n. Versus if you differentiate and then try to optimize your code, you may not be able to perform that optimization. So, you know, all these little details really add up in the end. You know, if you if you're not just looking at differentiating a big neural network with a big matrix 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 multiplication, every O of N squared to O of N really adds up. And so this is why we keep on looking at these these details. Um, you know, to kind of showcase uh, the, the, uh, how this matters, you know, so here's here's enzyme on a Taylor series approximation. You can see that even for forward mode, it can outperform. Uh, uh, even its forward mode will outperform um, uh, forward diff because of the way that it makes use of these these uh, uh, optimizations. Um, but here, for example, you might see that, oh, you know, the naive version of Jax is, uh, is unable to solve this problem at the full size. Um, you can do a trick with Jax to make it so that way it can actually handle this problem. But it turns out that the only way to be able to make Jax handle this problem sufficiently is to use an operation, right? So this Jax.lax.4i loop, um, where that loop, uh, that those operations do not support reverse mode automatic differentiation. So in order to even come close to what Enzyme is doing, you have to disable the reverse mode AD in, in Enzyme. So as you can tell, you can't finish the benchmarks with reverse mode because Jax just doesn't allow you to do that. Um, so, so, so really, the, you know, Automatic differentiation and the improvements to automatic differentiation are being a, are kind of this major factor that's happening in the differentiable simulation space here. Um, and why does this matter? Well, it's because I'll, I'll point you to, to some other talks. 
that basically go into the, to the fact that when you build adjoints, when, so when you run the adjoint method, uh, the adjoint equation itself uses automatic differentiation within the adjoint definition, and that can change your, your performance by about two orders of magnitude. So even when you're writing down analytical solutions to derivatives, those analytical solutions will can use automatic differentiation to get a few orders of magnitude out. So, I mean, what this means is that, you know, there's piles and piles and piles of, of tricks that, they, that are used to get here. It's not just one trick. It's not just uh, two. It's, it's a whole list of papers you know that we can point to that is these are all the optimizations involved to get to that 10,000 um, and if you want to know want to keep track of how things are, gr are growing we have a new benchmark site that just launched that uh, shows all the current benchmarks on, on things so just go to benchmarks.siml.ai if you have a case that's not being benchmarking well please just uh, give us a pull request it runs automatically on this computer that we have and allows us to track the performance over time and we can use that to optimize more things um, but now I, I, what I want to get to, how much time do I have left? Um, yeah, so now for, for this last part, I want to kind of get to the, this you know, tech transfer kind of idea. So um, what we're really seeing is that you know, since uh, 2019, 2020, when this scientific machine learning uh, approach would kind of started to explode, what we started to see is that there's a lot of companies adopting it. You know, so Moderna was one that I mentioned, uh, but we're working with a lot of other groups. For example, ASML has now been public about having 300 uh, engineers that are using Julia, and they're running entire trainings for, for new Julia users, right? So ASML, I know it's been in the news quite a bit late recently you know, about, you know, they're the only ones that can do this very high precision engineering. Uh, what is their trick? Well, it turns out we learned that their trick is kind of Julia. <laughs> uh, so, OK, so, you know, as we've gotten all this adoption, right, we know, know these pieces are really starting to be used. Um, really, one of the questions that, that I've been trying to answer is, you know, how do we translate scientific machine learning to industry use, right? And I didn't think that this was a problem for a while, right? You know, I took the until I until I started working in in industry with these startups, right? I thought, you know, this is open source code. Make your open source code good enough, and and people will like it, and people will start to use it. And that that's true that people will like it and start to use it, but. What we have here, right, you know, we've had so many things that are going well. You know, we have all these people that are using it for, you know, for using it for all these different cases like, you know, gravitational waves and, and climate models and et cetera, et cetera. But the thing that's true about all these individuals is that they are doing a PhD in computational science and machine learning. And so where scientific machine learning is at today is that if you have or are doing a PhD in computational science, you are a perfect person to use these codes. And then the, you go over to a pharmacology you know, place, you go to a, one of these pharmacies and they say, okay, you know, well, we don't have those people. We have people that have developed drug design. How do they use this code? And you go, <laughs> Um, well, first teach them, uh, you know, ODEs and PDEs and adjoint methods and machine learning and da, 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 da. And once they know all that, they can use the code, right? They're good. <laughs> and so that's not, that's a non-solution, right? So, so th this, this has really been an interesting thing where it's like, you know, Pfizer, if they want to make use, let's, let's say Pfizer wants to make use of, you know, scientific machine learning to do automated model discovery, to help out the way that they build models of some organ. Well, how does Pfizer do this in two months? you know, and not make it a three-year PhD to add, add a new method to this, right? That's a very different problem. Um, how do they make it so that way they boot up the code one time and it works? And so this is where we've been working with the, the proprietary part. So the open source code, you know, is this, uh, the Julia Simel organization. And the purpose of it is that you can see the whole code. You can, you can modify anything that's in the entire stack. Sometimes the stack trace is a little intimidating because it literally shows you everything. But um, yeah, everything is there. You can modify the definition of floating point power all the way up to what neural network architecture you use. Um, and the reason is because in the open source idea, Right, we did this so that way scientific machine learning, everyone can try their own ideas. Choice was the number one goal there, right? Every method possible can be done. Every every tweak that you want to do, every single piece of research idea, allow this to be done. Researchers should be uninhibited. And so you know, almost think about it as like you know, the, the the guide there was Linux, right? There's you know, you can see the whole code, and if you want Bash to to work differently, or if you want a new uh, module in it, just write your own module and do it, right? Um, but that's very different from the goal of doing this in a tech transfer style, right? Because really what you want is you want something to work the first time and just do it for me, right? Because, you know, so someone who's industry who watches this talk doesn't go, wow, there's all these different improvements to methods. It's, it's 
they what they think is I hope he put together this one piece of code that does all the right things for me, <laughs> right? You know, not oh, it's not wow. There's eight different types of adjoints I can do. I can really look into which one is the most performant. Instead, it, the question is, okay, does it automatically choose one that's reasonably good enough the first time? Right, and so really, really, what what the problem is is, can you start to do this in a way that does not require a user to understand any of the mathematics, requires no understanding of it, and just is like autocomplete? You know, you think about, um, you know, you you type into Google, right, and it, and it auto completes your sentence. Can you auto complete models in such a way where someone is doing this from a GUI that understands nothing about the mathematics? Um, and you know, can you, you know, also the things that make it proprietary are things like. You know, when you then generate the plot at the end of the day, well, you know, if Moderna is using it, it better match Moderna's logo colors. Otherwise, it's not allowed in the FDA submission. Like all those extra details add up, right? Um, and so, the, you know, you can almost think about it as the difference between Linux and Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux, right? You know, the one, the, the one that's the enterprise is really made to made to work with support and all that. And so, this is what we've been developing as Julia Sim on this, you know, this other hat, which is the, you know, the the open source or the the, the sorry the you know, director of modeling and simulation for a uh, for a startup company, right? Um, so, okay, so how do we get this to, to something that we can start to say is usable in an industry sense? So what we've been developing is something that has multiple different modules. Um, in fact, one of the different one of the next talks here will be from uh, one of the one of the individuals helping build the controller module. So I won't talk about controls at all because you'll get a whole talk on that. Um, but you know, basically what we can do is we can say these are the industry high level problems, right? You know, abstract away all the little details about machine learning and everything. It's, you know, do you have data and no models? Let's build a model for you. Do you have models but no data? You know, let's speed up your models with the uh, surrogate building. Do you have uh, models and you want to match it to data? Well, here's the thing for that, you know, very high level. And um, and what we can do is we can start to piece together these workflows that say, OK, you know, use this tool, then this tool, then this tool. And we can start to build GUIs that are doing this in a way that is, you know, tying together these steps for specific applications. And so let me kind of go into to two of these tools, the model optimizer and the circuit builder. What we're doing with the model optimizer is going into the, this process and saying, OK, what is what if you have infinite compute? What is the right way to do this training process, right? So if you look at what at this literature of scientific machine learning, what you'll see is that a lot of times the very basic method for learn for this training might not work, right? And so the liter the academic literature says, oh, you know, the, the simple thing didn't work, so try multiple shooting. All right, that's that's one thing. You know, the simple method didn't work, but try co-location, right? And this is something that, you know, as a researcher, yeah, try a, try all these different variations, try your own variation, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want to actually make this work the first time, what is the combination or what is the what is what are the heuristics to know what different ways you should do this training problem so that way you can get it right the first time? Someone can just click a button and expect it to not fall into a bad local minima. Right. This this is what I'm saying is like, you know, this is a tech transfer question because that will earn you zero NeurIPS papers, right? Because every method that's in there is a method that's already been done, right? And in fact, it's you know, it's, you don't have the chance to hyperparameter tune, so it's not going to get as low as the loss function. So you're not going to get state of the art, according to you know an ML paper reviewer, right? But this is what has to be solved in order to do this in practice. So one needs to be able to click a button on a GUI and be able to get this neural network to give you the minimum without having to tweak things. And so this is what we're working on with the Julia Sim model optimizer. Um, we're doing this in ways that also include uncertainty quantification, which I won't go in, into too much detail. And we're doing this with the with the model autocomplete, right? Because once you can once you can learn parameters of a system, you can stick neural networks with that system, and you can make this into a full model autocomplete if you can fully automate the symbolic regression process afterwards as well, right? And so this is what we're aiming with with Julia Sim. I'll say that we're we're heading there. We're quite a bit there, but I won't say that we're all the way there, right? But th this is this is you know to just kind of I'm just trying to you know uh, you know st flow the waters on like why 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 is there are there more problems in the scientific machine learning space that are specific to you know commercialization? This is something that would never ever ever I will never be able to publish on this. I know that from the start, you know, because it does not improve the methods in terms of you know the academic sense. Well, this is what needs to be solved for scientific machine learning to be as uh, prevalent as Simulink or Dimola or ANSYS Fluent, right? If you need to have someone be able to use a GUI, click a button and be able to do it. Um, 
And so we're working a lot on this with the pharmaceutical industry. There's a lot of successes and in, in, in things going right now, a lot of uh, POCs, and I think that we'll be hearing a bit more about it. Um, let me then go into the, the surrogate section. So, uh, so what is a surrogate? I don't think I've mentioned surrogates yet. So a surrogate of a dynamical system is basically you want to take a differential equation uh, model, you want to replace it with a neural network, um, and, we, and basically you want the, the neural network model, version of the model, and the simulation to be very similar to each other in terms of the output. Now, why would you do that? Well, if you choose a machine learning model that's faster to run than the original simulation, then you can get something that you can replace the simulation with, and now you have something that runs faster. And, and so what we're doing in, in this space, it's, it's, you know, this space is really about expanding the, how much, once again, how automatic these machine learning methods can be. We're making it so that way we can take in modeling toolkit models, which I think some people talked about here before. Um, also mode, uh, models from say Modelica, right? So other tools, Modelica, Simulink, uh, Spice models, all these different other types of models and allow machine learning to be done on them automatically by using the FMU interface and training surrogates directly on this interface. So for example, we can take a slow model in Simulink and train a machine learning model in, in Julia to match the Simulink model's behaviors. So then you can say, try new controls on it and you get the speed of Julia on the Simulink model. Um, we're, we're seeing, you know, this has been creating quite a buzz because we have a bunch of different papers on different performance out aspects. So you, you can uh, accelerate surrogate model or circuit models by about 100 times, uh, others models by a few hundred times. I want to go into detail here. You know, this is this is not the salesy talk, so let's like go into a little bit of the math here about why why this is interesting in, in terms of a tech transfer uh, question, right? So so when we're doing this, right, when I'm talking about these surrogate methods, what I'm talking about is actually a continuous time ecosystem state network. It's a different method for this training than what I've been mentioning before. And you know, why why is that? If I'm doing someone that's doing so much on uh, differential simulation, why does this piece have a different method? And so uh, the, the way to visualize reservoir computing methods is that you basically assume that you have a fixed dynamical system. You run this dynamical system and what you want to find is a projection between that dynamical system and your oh, and the one that you want to make predictions of. And, and, and that, that's high level, et cetera, et cetera. So let's do this in a very concrete way. So the, the, the continuous time echo state network is, a, a set, is, is almost like a neural ODE, right? So you write down this equation where you say, you know, I have an ODE where on the right hand side is one layer of a neural network. And now instead of, instead of directly predicting what my observables are, what I say is that I allow myself a linear projection from my reservoir to my um, to my normal space, and what I do here is is I say you know th so this is almost a neural ODE. Oh, well, I mean, well, in in this form, it kind of is a neural ODE, but I do something different, right? I say my reservoir system is fixed. So I say my weights inside of this one layer neural network, the weights right here are going to be a fixed matrix. I take a random matrix of some form and I just fix the value there. So this is now not quite a neural ODE because there are some things that are just a fixed value. But what happens if I write my, my neural ODE in this in this form? Well, what happens is, is a training trick just evolves out of here. Because if A is something that it, if A is something that is fixed, right, then I uh, then what happens is uh, R prime equal da, 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 this is fixed. I can actually just run the reservoir once and I get a random dynamical system. And all I have to do is figure out how to project from R to X. And then I can basically run this reservoir and, and understand how to do these projections at new parameters. And, and so uh, what, what you see is that, you know, oh, if all I need to learn is a projection from this dynamical system to the one I want, all I have to learn is a projection, which I can do via a, a linear solve. There's no gradient based descent here. There's no, no nothing that can, you know, no, no hyperparameters to optimize. You just do backslash, right? SVD. Um, it's also numerically stable. You can prove that, right? And so, it's, and you know that you get the minimum every single time because that's a property of SVD. And so, and so, if you want to do this, then at new parameters. So, if you want to have a, if you want to have a, a a machine learning like thing that predicts what your dynamical system will be at new parameters, what you can do is you can get a bunch of these projections. So you have one reservoir, and you understand what its projections are at a bunch of different parameters. And then you can build a, a, an interpolation between those parameters using a radial basis function or a neural network. And now basically what you do is you put the, the parameters into a neural network. 
Um, you put the parameters into a neural network that gives you out what your projection is, and now you just run your that, that reservoir system, and every, every time you look at the reservoir system, you know what your original system should do. This is a purely non-differentiable way, but why would I have gone to this if I just told you that differentiation is, is better in a lot of cases? Well, the reason is because this just kind of works without anyone tweaking. And so if your goal is to build a system, if, if your goal is to build a system that works the first time from a GUI and gets two digits of accuracy, you should do the thing that does that very easily. And if your goal is, is so that way someone can you know, tweak this and get a very good accurate approximation to a climate model within a year, you should do that method. And those two are not the same method. Those are different methods, right? And so this is what we've been really looking at in the scientific machine learning space of, you know, these different methods have different properties. Um, I know that I know that this continuous time echo state network will never be as fast as the fully trained neural ODE. Can you guess why? Well, it's because I took half, I uh, took the majority of the parameters inside of here and made them fix values. And so there's no way that, you know, I have so many less parameters for the same size model that there's no way this is going to be as accurate as the fully tuned version. But this is something that trains really quickly. In fact, it just trains with the SVD. So if we just know the size of the system, we can guess the, the time. There's no, you know, number of, of steps. You know, there's no number of iterations or, or, or you know, uh, the gradient descent learning rate or anything to choose. It's just... Can, it can be something that you could literally can stick in in a GUI and expect to work reasonably well, but not as well as the best method. But it, you know, on average, doing pretty good. And so, this is what we've been kind of starting to use and showcase to a lot of different uh, aspects. So, for example, we've been working with Mitsubishi Electric, where we showed that this uh, first of all, the Julia differential equation methods and everything outperformed uh, Daimola, the Modelica simulator, by about six times. And then we used this continuous time echo state network and showed that we can get less than 5% error over the whole time series uh, for all parameters um, while getting about 100 times speed up over our simulator. So the total speed up then was about 570x. We need the 6x times the other piece. Um, and so the, the key thing about this, though, is that this is just using the simulator and a very easily repeatable method. If you take the neural ODE stuff and everything, you can probably get this to about 3000x or 5000x. But this is at least something that will work the first time. Different goal for a very similar problem. Um, Oh, and, and the other thing that comes out of this method is that uh, if, you know basically what you need to do, right, is you just need to uh, you you just need to be able to have the solution of your of your differential equation system at a bunch of different parameters, and then you do one giant SVD, which makes it very amenable to to uh, parallel computing, right? You run that 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 simulation at different parameters all at the same time, and then you do an SVD. Turns out the SVD is normally not as big of a cost as the simulations itself. And the simulations, if you have cloud compute, you can run them all in parallel because the cloud never runs out of cores. You know, as Google will tell you, it just basically is infinite. And so you, you this, this as a software can look magical, right? Because, you know, you can go, well, does it, you know, I do need to do some training of the neural networks to be able to make this go faster, but I can run all of the, of the training uh, runs at the same time, right, using this elastic compute. Right, you can click a button. It spawns up 100,000 computers, runs all at the same time, and so about in the time, in the real time to that it takes to do about two or three simulations, it comes back with this, with this surrogate that runs hundreds of times faster. Right? Again, you know, the academic question is. Oh, you know, did you ever recover the time it took, you know, to do the training, right? You know, if you add up the total training time and then the, the speed that you get there, does that end up faster for your application, right? That's the academic question. In the real world, though, the question is, how fast is someone, how fast did I get it in my hands to be able to finish the project? And this is a very parallelizable method. And so therefore, this method ends up making a lot of sense for the tech transfer, right? Because you click a button, the whole thing is embarrassingly parallel. In the time of about three simulations, now your whole computer runs blazingly fast, right? Very different problem from the academic problem. Um, and so what we've been doing with Julia Sim is we've been making it so that way the code to do this is relatively easy. So here, for example, we take an FMU from Daimola, um, the DCPM model, which is one of these Modelica standard library models. Um, we say run a surrogate on it. We need to put this on the surrogate machine. It actually happens in the Julia Hub cloud, so it'll parallelize as much as it wants to. It actually does the parallelism implicitly. You don't have to tell it how many computers. It will know how to do it for you. Um, and then you can even say, oh, generate an FMU for me. So this 
this actually, this code takes in an FMU from uh, from Daimola or or Simulink. It runs this process and gives you out a new FMU where this new FMU has similar input output behaviors as the original one. It just runs 100 and 500 times faster, right? And so this is something that we're then building as a product for how you know scientific machine learning then is improving Simulink or Daimola like workflows. Um, and so here, for example, is this result running in Simulink, right? You know, you, you take a model from Simulink, you run this training process, you get something 100 times faster. Now you can put that FMU as a block in Simulink and run it and see, oh, hey, now it runs faster. In fact, you know, and, and, and when I mentioned that we're bringing this all the way to GUIs, this actually has a no-code interface. So that way someone can just, you know, drag an FMU in there, say, you know, we do still have, a, you know, what is the size of this reservoir? So there still is a hyperparameter, right? You still have to choose one hyperparameter, but if you choose that hyperparameter, you know, that's just one slider there. Oh, also number of sample points. Then you click the surrogatize button and this thing takes in an FMU, spits it out an FMU that runs faster, right? A very similar problem at, at a high level to the, what we're doing with the you know, open source thing, but a very different goal. And so it kind of is using slightly different methods. And so, yeah, so that's that's Julia Sim, and that's how Julia Sim relates back to the open source thing, and you know all the different questions that we're looking into as both the uh, you know the MIT Julia Lab, uh, Julia Julia Computing, and then also uh, through a bit of uh, Pumas AI and the pharmacometrics in there. So, yeah, thank you very much. Questions? wondering about Julia Sim, uh, is purely commercial or also academic? And yeah. it runs in the cloud, right? Yeah, so so Julia Sim is being built to only run in the cloud because you know it, this the whole purpose of a lot of these algorithms is to use this this parallelism automatically. Um, though. Uh, what we're what we're going to be doing for academics is offered to academics at cost. So there is a cost to do the ca parallel computing itself. Then there's the cost on top of that of you know running Julia Sim. So for example, Julia Sim is thirty dollars an hour. Um, but then you know you have the a AWS cost of like you know this much cost for this much compute per hour, right? Um, what we're going to be doing for academics is basically uh, have a way so that way you could apply to remove the that thing because it's mostly targeted at commercial use cases, but um, you know, for academics, academics don't have money. So if you, as long as you could pay for the parallel compute, then you can use it. Yeah. Yeah. For example, to use the the tool that we're going to have presented now. Yeah. In in, in fact, yeah. And and I I say that one one of the things I want to be doing soon is that this Julius and model optimizer should be doing the the you know this this parameter fitting thing in a full almost fully automated way. We want to try to make it so that way it works on almost every case, which means we want academics to throw code at it and tell us where it fails, right? And so, you know, that's a that's an ongoing thing. And